I wish to begin by thanking wholeheartedly the organizers of the conference Trends in Logic 9, the Pontifical University, the Copernicus Center, the editors of Studia Logica, especially also Adam Oshevsky, for making this stimulating meeting possible. Jesquia. For my first trick, ladies and gentlemen, I will need a volunteer from the audience, a volunteer who is willing and able to assert some simple and well-known theorems of conventional, otherwise known as classical mathematics, or at least to assert some claims that are widely thought to be true and well-known. Professor Abramson, will you? We're going to have a little playlet here. It's called Waiting for Brower, with apologies to Samuel Beckett. Uh, my colleague here will read off and assert, because I think you believe these, right? Sure. Claims of conventional mathematics, and I will read off the true claims of intuitionistic mathematics in cadence with him. There, Professor. There are total discontinuous real-valued functions over the real numbers. There are no total discontinuous real-valued functions over the real numbers. Every real number is either equal to zero, less than zero, or greater than zero. It is false that every real number is either equal to zero, less than zero, or greater than zero. Some total natural number, number functions certainly cannot be computed algorithmically. All total natural number functions certainly, well, you don't write your own script here, certainly can be computed algorithmically. Thank you. I'm on page two now. I am not normally a betting man, but I would wager that every one of you understood every word that I, a practicing card-carrying intuitionist, just uttered, as well as every word uttered by my conventionalistic or classical colleague, Professor Abramson. Further, I wager that on the basis of that common or shared understanding, you came to know at least that what I said in enunciated some plain truths of intuitionistic mathematics straightforwardly contradicts the equally plain falsehoods uttered and asserted by my very helpful colleague. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, I am not concerned to sort out the various truths from the various falsehoods, to determine which of us, if any, is right and which is wrong in those assertions. Rather, I wish to concentrate on a fact that I take to be obvious and unassailable, namely, that my assertions in each pair contradict the corresponding assertions of my noble and illustrious colleague. That is, that when he spoke and I answered, what I said contradicted what he said. And what could be... I shall answer that question. And what could be plainer than that? After all, much of what is properly called the critical bearing of intuitionistic mathematics would be lost altogether if we intuitionists are refused the, li refused the liberty to decry and deny such falsehoods as the general law of the excluded third, the tertium non dator, to take one example, perhaps overly prominent. Today I hope to prove, right before your very eyes, that the acceptance of a general mathematical realism, even in a mild form, convicts one of the existence and reality of outright contradictions in mathematics. As befits a conference with this title, Church's Thesis, Church's Thesis will play a prominent role in that. As usual, despite old Hilbert's repeated insistence to the contrary, there's more than a little trouble now in Cantor's Paradise. I hate to point it out, but in Cantor's Paradise, as in more terrestrial climes, property values lately stand at disastrously low levels. Apart from yours truly and a small number of right-minded disciples, every philosopher of mathematics, Stu, that I know, would want to deny vehemently, utterly, and comprehensively my insistence that any conventional statement or classical statement from the first group, page three, as uttered by my colleague Darren, contradicts any statement of the second group uttered with all due seriousness by yours truly. Now, and I have to ask this even though it is sad and embarrassing, what would lead one to endorse such a preposterous doctrine? In answer, one can, I think, point out a number of influences. One hesitates to call them reasons, some of which are historical and others theoretical. I shall restrict my treatment today to one of the more salient of historical influences. As is so often the case in this veil of tears, the historical influence I have in mind is a glorious hangover, a humdinger of a hangover. 
It's a hangover from a binge drunk and an idea once au courant among the logical positivists of yore. The idea was this, that the basic principles of mathematics, all of mathematics, intuitionistic as well as conventional, are number one, true, and number two, owe their truth entirely to the meanings of the various linguistic terms that feature in them. In order to shore this up, their positivistic fantasy about meaning, the positivists had to play fast and loose with meaning and demand in the face of obvious contradiction that the terms featuring in the statements of the intuitionists do not possess the plain, ordinary mathematical meanings that they so clearly possess. Furthermore, the positivists insisted that those self-same intuitionistic meanings once exposed must be seen more or less immediately to certify the main claims of the intuitionists as true. I remark en passant that this was not a burden that many were seriously eager to impose equally upon conventional mathematicians. Few scholars then or now insist that the axiom of regularity, for example, be an immediate expression of the meanings of such terms as set and member. I will not have the opportunity here and now to perform the complete demolition on this silliness, page four, that I would so much like to perform. <clears throat> At the moment, however, suffice it to say that, try as they might, the logical positivists of then and their fellow travelers, even in the present day, could never come to any firm agreement on what those strange, antinomial, intuitionistic mathematical meanings were. Let me run through a few of their lamer suggestions. Number one, first. There are those who once believed that the main culprit and bearer of a specifically intuitionistic meaning is a logical sign, the humble and innocent existential quantifier, also known as the backwards E. The idea was that the intuitionists are supposed to attach a special constructive meaning to the existential quantifier that is not attached to the same quantifier when it appears in conventional mathematics. In response to that suggestion, I point out that the logical rules for quantifiers that the intuitionist Arendt Heitink once codified, the rules of formal intuitionistic logic for the quantifiers, do not in themselves differ one iota from the familiar formal rules of the quantifiers in conventional logic. Those rules, folks, are the same. Moreover, as is well known, forms of intuitionistic set theory agree with conventional set theory up through pi zero two statements over the natural numbers, that is, universal existential statements on the natural numbers. Moreover, conventional and intuitionistic mathematics do not in general agree when it comes to theorems that do not contain the backwards E. For example, and this will play an important role in what is to come, the negated form of the halting predicate, or if you prefer, the non-halting predicate, that is, there's no number M on which Turing machine index N halts, this provides a counterinstance to the tertian non dator. This is provable in intuitionistic arithmetic. And this theorem can be formulated perfectly without any appearance of the backwards E. Lastly, there are any number of appearances of the existential quantifier in expressions of truths of intuitionism that cannot reasonably bear a constructive interpretation. There are finite, excuse me, there are transfinite, there are finite ones too, but there are transfinite cardinal numbers. There are lawless sequences, that is sequences that are absolutely non-rule governed. And every set has a power set, are three of those truths. I choose them at random. Page five. Second suggestion. On this next tale of meaning change, negation is the culprit. It's thought that the sign for negation is to bear some peculiar or special non-standard meaning, a meaning that perhaps makes it a stronger negation than its conventional brother. The trouble with this suggestion is that advocates of the non-standard negation view could never come to a generally agreed formulation of what that special meaning is. Furthermore, from the supposition that there's a specifically intuitionistic negation and that it accounts for the differences between intuitionistic and classical mathematics, we get no explanation whatsoever for the differences that do not involve negation. For example, the fact that Peirce's law, there it is, if P then Q, all then P then P, is not a theorem of formal intuitionistic logic. That's one of them, right? This is the theorem of conventional propositional logic, but not of intuitionistic formal logic. The fact that every total natural number, natural number valued function of the natural numbers is recursive is another such fact. Third, there are those anti-realists, acolytes to the beatified Michael Dummett, who preach that all the logical connectives and quantifiers of intuitionism are at fault, not any one in particular. They are all supposed to collaborate in pulling a semantical trick, making my words, words that you understood perfectly well when I said them, 
means something other and secret that they suppose you do not understand. To capture those special intuitionistic meanings, the differences between their presumptive meanings and those of their conventional counterparts wholesale, we need, according to the anti-realists, a new anti-realistic semantics. These anti-realists would have it that this semantics plays a role with respect to intuitionistic logic and formalized mathematics analogous to the role played in the classical case by Tarski's semantics and model theory. Page six. The trouble here is patent. No one has ever provided a successful anti-realistic semantical theory for intuitionistic mathematics that plays the role there of Tarski's model theory. And there's a good reason to think that such a theory will never be forthcoming. A tiny fragment of intuitionistic set theory proves that intuitionistic propositional logic, not to mention predicate logic, higher order logic, is incomplete with respect to substitutional semantics. Here you simply substitute names in for predicates. Tarski semantics of the usual kind, talking about structures and models, Kripke semantics, and Beth semantics. So all of these are provably incomplete with respect to intuitionistic propositional logic. Finally, <clears throat> one more suggestion. Folks who should know better, among them Bill Tate, have turned their attentions away from the logical science. For them, the culprit behind the differences between conventional and intuitionistic mathematics is mathematical, not logical. Some of them fasten upon the word function and its cognates. They would have it that the intuitionist means something else by the word function than is meant by conventional mathematicians. They demand that by the word function, the intuitionist does not mean a collection of ordered pairs that are univalent in their second components. Once again, however, these functionalists are hard pressed to say in any very definite terms what this new intuitionistic meaning attached to the word function is supposed to be. Besides, I hasten to point out that if you consult any competent textbook on intuitionist success theory, you will learn that by the word function, the intuitionist means nothing more nor less than collection of ordered pairs that are univalent in their second components, just as you would learn from any competent textbook in conventional set theory. So much for my brief survey of recent silliness in the positivistic tradition about intuitionism. Now, I've cleared the floor, let's do something sensible. Page seven, something sensible. Today, I console myself with deducing from the most basic idea of mathematical realism an outright contradiction. Now, this particular deduction is schematically an old and familiar, very old friend, if you like, an old, a very old friend wearing a slightly new hat. The deduction that it exists is not the point. Any high school kid could do this. One of my points is this. It's italicized. The deduction is in no way intuitionistic or conventional exclusively, but ought to be accepted by both those pugilists in the foundational slugfest. So everybody involved, conventionalist or intuitionist, needs to accept what I'm about to do. The second point is that the whole business offers a challenge to members of the audience who don't like the conclusion of the argument, namely that the thesis of mathematical realism, when added to some highly elementary mathematics, leads to an outright contradiction. Perhaps members of the audience who don't like that conclusion will help me out by explaining to me in detail and correctly where, at precisely what step, I've gone awry in the argument. Will explain to me exactly what fallacy I've committed and will tell me just where I have to put, where I, just where I have put one across. I have nothing up my sleeve except a debt to Richard Dedekind and his superlative monograph, Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen? Here goes the deduction to start I take this to be a central thesis of the mathematical realist. It's on the bottom of page seven. Generally put, mathematics, all of it, owes its great metaphysical and epistemic power over us to its truth, that is the truth of its theorems. That truth consists in mathematics' ability to report correctly upon the internal characters of various whatnots as determined by the properties and relations obtaining among the, page eight, components of those whatnots, components I call ding-dangs. Now, I'm not, or I am sorry, I'm not, not sorry, I am sorry, if you've not been in touch with recent developments in the theory of whatnots and their component ding-dangs. The absolute need for such a neutral theory arises because mathematical realists and their various stripes cannot agree one with another about the most elementary posits of their shared theory. Some would have it that mathematical claims are true in virtue of reporting correctly 
and exclusively upon the behaviors of sets and their component elements. Willard Van Orman Quine was one of these. Other realists around here would have it that mathematical claims are true when they are by reporting correctly upon mathematical structures and the component positions in those structures. Yet others demand that no, mathematical claims are true in virtue of reporting correctly on the goings on in and among one or another of Eilenberg's and McLean's categories and the objects and sub-objects inhabiting those categories. There are even others that I won't list here, it's too boring. I shall, therefore, continue to refer, rather than to structures or sets or categories, to whatnots and their internal ding-dangs, rather than to sets and elements or structures and positions or categories and objects, because I do not, even by implication, wish to claim allegiance to any of these forms of temporary insanity. I have recourse then, and only then, to a neutral theory of whatnots and ding-dangs. If you press me, I would have to admit that I'm using the neutral theory in this deduction because I don't give a ding-dang what any of these realistically construed mathematical thingies really are or not. Now we go to work. What are the basic statements of a serious conventional theory of the arithmetic of the natural numbers? Page 9. As primitive terms, we have the symbol 0, the unary function s, the binary function symbols for plus, times, and capital E for exponentiation, which we all write infix. The binary logical relation symbol of two bars, also written in fix. The individual variables, lowercase x, y, and z, and the same again with natural number subscripts, x1, y1, z1, for example, and unary set variables, capital X, y, z, with numerical subscripts as well. From these, as is familiar, we form the usual compound terms, both close and open. For example, SSS0 as a symbol is a standard syntactic numeral for three. There are also computational terms, such as s0 plus x, 1 plus x if you like, and x to the power s0, etc. From these in turn, using the double bar and set variables, we build atomic formulae closed and open. The elementary sort of atomic formula is obtained by writing a term 1, the double bar, term 2. Just take two of the terms and put the double bar in between. For the higher order sort of atomic formula, we write a unary set variable followed by a term. For example, x followed by a term in parentheses. All this is familiar. Now we combine such atomic formula using the four standard connectives, conjunction, disjunction, conditional, negation, and the two quantifiers, existential and universal, iterating each a finite number of times to obtain the class of arithmetic formulae, both open and closed. We allow unlimited quantification with both individual and set variables. Again, all standard stuff. Among the closed formulae, we pick out those that qualify as axioms of the theory. Page 10. Your glasses aren't broken. Page 10 came out in a different type font. Sorry about that. Those of you who have the bifocals like me will have to use the smaller, lower part of your glasses. First, we have recursion axioms for successor terms. No number has a successor that's zero. Numbers with the same successor are equal. Then we have the usual recursion axioms for addition, multiplication, exponentiation. For example, for addition, add any number to 0, we get the same number back. Any number x added to the successor of y is the same as the successor of the sum of x and y. Finally, we have full comprehension, that is, every definable property defines a set, and a higher order induction on all sets. If a set x contains 0 and is closed under successor, every number belongs to x. These are the axioms of, as everyone knows, second-order piano data and arithmetic, conceived of, for the moment, conventionally. As everyone here also knows, it's a powerful theory in which one can formulate and prove all the familiar results of standard arithmetic and real analysis. One can show that the natural numbers are arranged in a well-founded linear order with the zero thing as a least member. And one can formulate and prove, page 11, that the halting problem is unsolvable, and hence, that there are total functions the characteristic function of the halting problem set being one of them, that are not Turing computable. In other words, Church's thesis, now I point out here that the statement of Church's thesis I'm about to give is intuitionistic Church's thesis. It has an extra half on it that the classical Church's thesis does not have. We'll come to that in a minute. The statement that every total function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers is Turing computable is provably false on the conventional view of things numerical. Next, 
I apply to this well-known and well-loved theory the basic principle of mathematical realism. So, we know that there is a whatnot, and that these axioms are true in virtue of reporting correctly on the situation in that whatnot when it comes to its component ding-dangs. For the remainder of the talk, we will call this the classical whatnot, and its components classical ding-dangs, or a C whatnot, and C dings for short. So that there can be reports in the arithmetical language, there are ding-dangs in the whatnots denoted by the basic closed terms. There is a ding-dang in the C whatnot denoted by the zero symbol, and there's a unary operation on the C whatnot denoted by the S symbol, and there's a binary relation of equality on the C dings denoted by the binary double bar symbol, all quite familiar. In the classical theory, we can prove that there are infinitely many C dings, that they are set into a linear order by the ding-dang operation denoted by S, that there is a least such C ding in the order, it's denoted by the zero symbol, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry? You say that there is a binary relation of equality. Yes. A binary relation is not a big dunk and not towards dot. We all understand. Yeah. Thanks to the correct reporting of the induction axiom, we can reason up the induced order on the C whatnots using sets closed under the operation noted by S. All good, all well known, all conventional. But now, what about the shiningly brilliant and intuitionist and his clever arithmetic? Up to a point, it is very much the same story. The intuitionists have the same formal language of arithmetic, I must emphasize this, with the same primitive terms, page 12, the same compound terms, the same atomic formulae, the same closed and open formulae. Further, intuitionists have very much the same axioms. Zero is the successor of no number. Numbers with the same successor are equal. The identical recursion equations governing the symbols plus, times, and E full comprehension and mathematical induction over all sets. Here, we have at least one additional axiom, Church's thesis, the statement expressed in the formal language using formal renditions of Kleene's computation and upshot predicates that every total function of natural numbers is Turing computable. There is also, by the way, something called the uniformity principle, I won't go into that today, governing all sets of natural numbers, but that will not concern us today. Since I'm addressing a conference on Church's thesis, I ought to give some articulate reasons, if only in the form of sketches, to indicate why I think that Church's thesis is true and admits of proof. I have divided the reasoning into two parts, the first of which I take to be definitive. In that part, I prove that every natural number function is humanly computable. For that, I employ the mathematical assumptions, every proof starts with assumptions, here are some of mine, sometimes misdescribed as Heiting's explanations which we can better describe as realizability with respect to humanly computable functions. The second part of the reasoning for Church's thesis, which is an argument for a, sta for, for a statement first proposed by Turing, is predicated upon an assumption that I will describe when we come to it. Here is the first part of the two-part argument. Let R be a binary total relation over the natural numbers. For every natural number x, there's a number y such that Rxy. When such a statement is realized, we know that there is a humanly computable function f that is total on x and such that, for every x, f on x realizes there is a y such that rxy. These are part of the assumptions to say what it is for a construction or a humanly computable function to realize a formula. Realizability for first order existential page 13 quantification then allows us for every x to select such a y. That's what realizability tells us. Furthermore, there is a humanly computable function g, therefore, that does the selecting. g is total on x, and such that for any x, relation r holds of x and gx in that order. And we are done. Every total binary relation of numbers is uniformized by a humanly computable function. We've laid down various axioms of, well, about what it is for a construction to realize a formula. Therefore, every total number theoretic function, each one of them is a total binary relation on numbers, is humanly computable. So ends the first and totally non-controversial part. What about the second, more controversial leg of the argument, showing that every humanly computable function is Turing computable? For this, there are a number of options, one of which might rely on Turing's analysis of human computation as set out in his justly famous 1936-1937 article on computable numbers. 
As an intuitionist, I must be careful with Turing's argument and employ a constructive proof of the version of the Heine Borel theorem, the theorem that Turing seems to have used to show that, when inscribed in any closed and bounded square of paper, at most a finite number of different symbols can be distinguished. There are intuitionistic proofs of the Heine Borel theorem, some of which involve what are called formal spaces. Another option, more Gerdelian this time, would be to argue that there is a recursively enumerable definitional extension, let's call it T, of ZF set theory, sufficient unto the needs of a theory whose algorithms humans can in principle tackle. Then, if F is a humanly computable function, there's an algorithm A, according to the instructions of which F is humanly computed. In the language of T, then, there's a set theoretic definition, perhaps a denotational semantics for the algorithm of A, call it capital D, such that for all natural numbers M and N, F outputs N on M, if and only if, down at the bottom of 13, algorithm A directs the human computer, thank you, Wilfred, for that, to output N on input M, if and only if, page 14, there's a derivation T of DMN. And the argument here is parallel to that, proving that every Turing computation can be defined in the language of uh, uh, elementary arithmetic, and its action can be mimicked there by using derivation. Let me say parenthetically what this argument is. This I take it to be part and parcel of the common claim that definitional extensions of set theory are sufficient under the needs of mathematics. If we take that seriously, that means that algorithms that can be carried out by human beings must be definable there, and we must be able in detail to prove their basic properties. And so I'm arguing that they are numerically definable, and once they're numerically definable, we know that they're sigma zero one. Let's read on. Page 14. As a result, the graph of f, the binary relation f of x equals y, is extensionally identical to a sigma zero one predicate. The derivability predicate, it is derivable in t that dxy, x and y are natural numbers. Notice here, t is not variable here, it is fixed. So I am arguing that there is a single definitional extension of set theory that's recursively enumerable that has this property. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, f is Turing computable since its graph is sigma zero one. Every humanly computable function is Turing computable. Following this time from our claim that set theory had a certain completeness property with, expressed to, with, with uh, reference to definition and proof. I should point out that this latter kind of encoding of a natural number algorithm into set theory, as well as the argument in Turing's paper, are plausible only on the assumption that one can faithfully encode the relevant internal states of a human computer into a finite number of finite states, and hence into a single natural number. Such an assumption is subject to some controversy, and at least to further investigation. I say parenthetically, to my mind, this may have been what Gödel was referring to later, when he talked about human beings whose mathematical abilities will infinitely extend that of any Turing machine. Why is that? Because their relevant internal states do not constitute a finite set of internal states. Well, by the way, I need not conclude from that that they constitute an infinite set of internal states. Do not commit the fallacy that every set is either finite or infinite. That is a, a fallacious claim, even in conventional mathematics. Reading on, <clears throat> I can now return to the main data Kindian argument. I will formulate that argument in terms of collections of ding-dangs, referring again to the classical ding-dangs of the first order as C-dings, their intuitionistic fellows as I-dings. First, I hope you will allow me a simplifying assumption that is inessential. No one will doubt that the I-dings comprise a collection that is at most countably infinite and in the usual time-honored fashion can be faithfully embedded as a sub-collection of the C-dings. That way, we can work exclusively with the domain of C-dings. As can be proved in the classical theory, the C-dings are closed under primitive recursive pairing. Pairs of C-dings can be treated as yet more C-dings. Let X be a collection of C-dings that, page 15, are pairs. We say that, definition on the top of 15, a collection X is good, provided that it contains the pair zero classical thing, zero intuitionistic thing. It has a largest pair in it. Its pairs are functional that is single-valued in the second component, injective, that is single-valued in the first component, and back-inductive. What do I mean by back-inductive? By back-inductive, I mean that whenever a pair in X consists of a classical successor of A and the intuitionistic successor of B, then X also contains the pair AB. So it can strip off one successor from each one. It is child's play to show by induction the union of any good collections is also good. 
Just as I do not have to work with a category of pairs of things, I don't have to work explicitly with finite collections or functions either. In both classical and intuitionistic domains, I can use powers of two or binary notation to encode finite collections. On this account, for example, as we all know, a finite collection, say the, the triple set unordered 2, 3, 4, is represented by 2 to the third power plus 2 to the fourth power plus 2 to the fifth power. <clears throat> I can now use the existential quantifier in the classical theory to define what will prove to be a single function between the classical dings and their intuitionistic counterparts in their respective domains, whatnots. I'll call the function capital F and say that a C thing is related to an I thing, C thing A is related to an I thing B, if and only if there exists, there's my existential quantifier, a C ding encoding a good collection, and the code of the pair AB is in that collection so encoded. That is my very simple definition of the relation capital F, page 16. <clears throat> It's also a very simple matter to prove that F relates the C thing zero to the I ding zero, it takes zero to zero. F is functional and F is injective. For those latter two, one uses the proven fact that unions of good collections are good. To show that capital F is a total function on the C things, one uses the classical principle of induction, reigning supreme over the classical whatnot throughout. To show that the capital F is injective, I'm sorry? When you talk about union, this is a little bit too quick for me. You talk about arbitrary union? Yes, sure. So how can you put something like induction if you talk about arbitrary union? I reduced the arbitrary union to an existential quantifier. Now, I'm encoding all the finite sets, and then I'm simply quantifying over them existentially. Second, since I have second order induction, it doesn't matter whether I can define. I've actually done it. It doesn't really matter whether I can define the induction predicate in the theory. It is a set. So by second order induction, it doesn't require that I define it. I'm quantifying over all sets. <clears throat> to show that the capital F is a total function on the C things, one uses the classical principle of induction, reigning supreme over the classical numbered whatnot domain. To show that capital F is surjective on the I things, one uses the intuitionistic induction. Therefore, the relation given by capital F is proven to be a total bijection between the first order part of the classical whatnot and that of the intuitionistic whatnot. None of this proof is objectionable, sorry, Arnold, right, either to intuitionists or to conventional mathematicians. Next, it is easy to show that the function capital F is also an isomorphism from the classical to the intuitionistic whatnot or domain. We've already seen that F takes the classical zero into the intuitionistic zero and that it commutes with the relevant successor functions on both the classical and intuitionistic sides. To complete the proof of the isomorphism as is familiar, one uses the recursion axioms for plus times and exponentiation. Finally, a proof by induction on formulae, both theories partake of the same class of formulae after all, shows that truths are preserved and back preserved via the isomorphism capital F between the two whatnots. So if a formula phi holds of a classical thing, A, in the classical whatnot, then phi holds of F of A, which is the intuitionistic thing, in the intuitionistic whatnot and conversely. Hence, every truth about the intuitionistic natural numbers holds of the classical natural numbers and conversely. By the way, this induction proof isn't really necessary because all I'm going to do is, all I need to do is show that the single formula that holds in the intuitionistic case also must hold in the classical case. So I don't need full induction on formulae. All I would have to check is that the isomorphism respects truth up through a finite number of connectives and quantifiers. Therefore, we have a contradiction. Church's thesis, the intuitionistic one, as we have seen, holds in the intuitionistic domain or whatnot, and so by isomorphism, it holds in the classical or conventional whatnots. Hence, it is true of the conventional page 17 whatnots that every function is Turing computable. But at the same time, the conventional mathematician, like my colleague, Professor Abramson, thinks to prove that Church's thesis is false, and that some functions on the natural numbers such as the characteristic function of the halting problem, are not Turing computable. So ends the main business of the day, QED. But now, before I yield the floor to questions and objections, I would like to say a few words that may cut some potential objections to my form of argument off at the pass. First, it's a mistaken objection, identity. Someone might object that I have assumed that the same identity governs both the conventional domain or whatnot and its ding-dangs, 
and its intuitionistic cousin when I am not entitled to that assumption. I respond that such an assumption is inessential. Each of the two theories, just the formal theories, conventional and intuitionistic, contains a suitable sub-theory of identity as part of the underlying logic. And on the basis of those, I can assume that the double bar relational sign in the conventional theory denotes an equivalence relation on that whatnot, and the same thing for the intuitionistic theory and its correlative whatnots. Both theories prove the theorem that the double bar relation, whatever it is, must be reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. Then I just take equivalence classes for the two relations. Very simple. This gives me a single identity relation covering, co covering each whatnot, and I proceed as before. Second mistake and objection. Someone might argue that to prove that isomorphisms preserve and co-preserve truths, I must assume that the intuitionistic quantifiers commute with the relevant reporting upon predicate. That is, I must assume that the intuitionistic domain or whatnot satisfies the arithmetic formula. There is an x such that a of x, where a of x is an open formula, if and only if there is an intuitionistic ding b, such that the intuitionistic whatnot satisfies open formula a of x with x naming b and that this familiar Tarskian principle, page 18, is not correct for intuitionistic existential quantification. This objection also fails. The claim just cited, namely that the whatnot or domain satisfies there is an x such as a of x, if and only if there's an intuitionistic thing b, such that the intuitionistic whatnot satisfies a of x with x naming b, represents standard intuitionistic practice and is used repeatedly, among other things, to justify intuitionistically the rules of intuitionistic existential quantification. And as we have said, these are the very same rules as the conventional rules. I should also remark that these Tarski clauses for existential universal quantifier are provable from Heiting's explanations, or what I called the realizability definition for human computability. Some final remarks. Number one. One of the philosophical conclusions, I'm not claiming it follows validly, but to, to which the argument of the present lecture leads me, I think, is this. There are no ultimate interpretations that stand behind all conventional and intuitionistic mathematics. Philosophers and other well-intentioned folks are wholly unable to tell us finally and univocally what the terms in the mathematics mean. They cannot tell us whether they refer in the last analysis to sets or to structures or to categories. Further, there is no ultimate meta-language neutral between conventional and intuitionistic mathematics, this is something that Carnap very much wanted, in which those interpretations can be presented. You can't breathe in a space, outer space, where there is no air. Number two, in many ways, the lecture you have just heard is a tribute. It's a tribute to a prescient mathematician of the 19th century. His name was Paul Dubois-Raymond. Dubois-Raymond was the brother of a famous physiologist, Emile Dubois-Raymond. Like his brother, Paul Dubois-Raymond maintained that mathematical science exhibited what they both called ignorabimus. Hilbert liked to rail against ignorabimus. In his monium opus, The Allgemeine Functionen Theory, General Function Theory of 1882, Paul Dubois-Raymond maintained, among other things, that mathematics, page 19, manifests ignorabimus within its boundaries, that there are explicit contradictions, and no foundational work of the future will ever be able to eliminate them with finality. Of course, Dubois-Raymond did not have Church's thesis, or what I call the uniformity principle in mind, when he thought and wrote of ignorabimus. For example, he thought that the question, are there infinitesimals among the present standard reals of the continuum, represents a problem that would be unsolvable, some mathematicians contradicting others on, the, on that particular topic, some arguing that there are infinitesimals, others that there are none. Now we know, on close analysis and from hindsight, that dubois Rimo in his book got a number of things wrong and a number of things confused. But I believe he did not get this part wrong. Hilbert, to the contrary, I'm sorry, Wilfred, in mathematics there is ignorabimus and plenty of it. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I have a question concerning this assumption about truth, because it seems to me that in order to operate, you should assume that arithmetic is omega consistent. In this case, Church's thesis is obviously false. 
you don't need to intu intuitionists and so on, but without truth, because you have a list of arithmetical truths which is not axiomatizable, <laughs> not intuitionistically given. <clears throat> so Class what, what is this? Because it, it seems to me that this assumption is classical. It is. Yeah, so you prove in classical meta theory that Church's thesis is under some assumptions false. false. But it doesn't solve any controversy between realists and intuitionists. But I am indeed arguing that it does. But notice that these are all classical inferences. So all the inferences you so properly made from a conventional point of view are conventional. But there is a complete intuitionistic set theory in metamathematics in which the inferences you mention fail. You can give a complete definition of truth a la Tarski, right? And yet, right, Church's thesis is true there. And consistent. I mean, th this is something that even a conventional mathematician could prove in the meta theory. By giving a cleany realizability interpretation to all of set theory, you can see that, right, if the intuitionistic theory, including Church's thesis, the formal theory, derive a formal contradiction, then you would have to derive that formal contradiction in the conventional theory. The relative consistency proof goes through. So that's, and this is all primitive recursive. I have uh, two remarks. Uh, one concerns your result that every truth about intuitionistic natural numbers holds also in the classical no natural number theory. So if you think in what circumstances these so-called strong counterexamples to excluded middle rise in, 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 in intuitionistic mathematics. It's always via um, continuity principle. Sometimes. So Sometimes. You, so it's not always. No. Okay. No. Then I'm with rowing. There right. Are there, are, there are. Well, Brouwer recognized three origins, right? First, the, as you know, the weak counterexamples. Yeah, and these come from the, exploiting, right, they're not propitive. They come from exploiting so-called open arithmetic problems, Goldbach's theorem being one of them, Goldbach's mm -hmm. conjecture. Right. Secondly, from the continuity principle for or numbers that Brouwer remote, used. That kind of stuff. Absolutely. Third, right, from Brouwer's creative subject, plus continuity principles. That's the third origin. Now, the but again, with continuity principles. You, well, you need them, because if you think carefully about it, especially in its form uh, in the My Hill kripke scheme form, it's classically correct. I mean, the theory of creative subject by itself is a classical theory. So in order to get the strong counterexamples, you must add something to that that's non-classical. The continuity principle would be one possibility. And then further, there are two other origins we have today, and which and Broward only pointed at these glancingly. Number one, what I call Church's thesis, and number two, what I call the uniformity principle. Church's thesis, as Kreisel pointed out, is a reduction principle for types over arithmetic, reducing them all effectively to natural numbers. The uniformity principle then works at the higher order level, right, in governing arguments not relating functions on numbers to numbers, but relating subsets of the natural numbers to numbers. And from those various origins, strong, strong counterexamples are all forthcoming. Okay, uh, then I proceed to my second comment. Uh, namely, Please. I thought that you were somehow too fast and quick with the negation. What's wrong, for instance, with Doug Pravitz's uh, approach to intuitionism? That means, well, the difference lies in the elimination rule for negation. Double negation. Okay. Right. And then, well, the, 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 then the fact that, uh, say, things like Peirce's law, they are subject of controversy. They are explained because basi by saying that basically you change the the, the, the concept of proof. So what's wrong with, with that approach? Well, That's notice, right? Notice what you've said there, and because I want to focus out there, are, there's not one locus of change you're talking about. You're talking about changing negation, and you're talking about changing the concept of proof. Yeah, so, because one influences the other. Yes. Yeah. Insofar as logic alone, formal logic is concerned, as we all know, one can point to a variety, depending on the formulation, Genson did this as well, the formulation of the logic as to what the bone of contention you might well be. Often negation is one of those. And there are other ways of formulating the, the differences of the logic. But then it's up to those, right, who wish to show this 
to show that that difference about negation can be pushed into arithmetic and into higher type and into set theory. So you must continue to try to convince me that negation is the culprit all the way up the, 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 the uh, theory from the logic to the top. So one, one more thing. The uniformity principle, I might as well say what it is. It's the principle that tells you that if you've colored the power set of the natural numbers with numbers, that color has to be, mono, mo, has to be monochromatic. In other words, if you can assign a natural number to every set of natural numbers, then there must have been one natural number that you assigned to all of them. That principle does not involve negation in any way. Okay, so if I gloss over point. what you said by saying that negation is not the full story because of the continuity principle bar induction, that's so the, then we, we, do we agree? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comments. I <coughs> would like to say that I like very much your uh, two theses which complete your work. <laughs> thank you for the kind question. Let's <laughs> I fully agree with them, um, but um, th there is a part of your talk on which I am some unclear um, uh, things. Uh, namely, when you argue that uh, um, that uh, negation, for instance, or or or. Uh, or quantifiers, intuitionistic quantifiers, are, uh, cannot be compared with, with uh, classical, uh, their the classical counterparts. Then it seems to me that you want to compare negation with negation, uh, uh, quantifier with quantifier. Well, in fact, uh, you have to compare the whole system, not just negation with negation, but the, the whole rules of one logic with rules of another logic. And the same is the, the case, in the case of set theory. You cannot just compare, uh, compare uh, uh, one, one symbol from set theory from another symbol set theory. So, for, so what, what I would like to say that uh, something, something which is uh, completely, completely obvious, I believe. When you select different, uh, different notation for intuitionistic logic and classical logic for, say, set theory in which you have axiom of choice and the set theory in which you have axiom of determinacy. So the, 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 they contradict each other. Right. Then you can write them uh, about, uh, uh, side by side. Yes, and they, they will not contradict. The problem is with this bridging area because you have to compare. But the, the, from point of view, from say of classical mathematics, you can compare classical mathematics with intuition theory. You can set some, some some rules which will tell you what is true in uh, intuition in CQ is true classically. And the, the, so such a comparison can be uh, done for, for also for such theories, of course. So but this ignorabimus <laughs> starts, in my opinion, somewhere in this area when we ask how to compare these different ideas. And, uh, and uh, mm, this doesn't prove that any of these ideas is better than another one. But though, if you take a look for, for, from the point of view of those who are doing factual science, then I'm... Uh, from those who are doing... Uh, doing factual science. Factual science. science yes. Uh, uh, different from what I was doing. Turning back to my, <laughs> to my talk, you know, just only for a moment, because I don't uh, want to occupy time with my, my, my own ideas then in some way the classical mathematics is most natural because it is strongest. It's, uh, this is what Popper was argued. T take the strongest hypothesis at, 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 at the beginning. That that's maybe that, that doesn't decide me between the determinacy and action of choice, but again, action of choice seems to be stronger than determinacy. So maybe the breathing area is, is, impo is, is impossible to find this breathing area. But anyway, if you look at the point of view of users of mathematics, maybe it's not, not, not uh, th there is uh, some choice between this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do want to say uh, that Certainly the point of view being represented here is not one of holism. Indeed, I am not adopting the view myself that the only way to compare these two accounts is to compare them as formal theories all together as units. So certainly that's a theme that's running through here. However, it is, does not seem to be a presupposition of the argument in question. 
I have to be shown where, if I'm making assumptions that are incorrect, right, where do they appear in the argument that I gave? It's just Dedekind's argument that everybody in this room accepted when they read Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen in kindergarten, right? Everybody accepted the argument. So what's wrong with it now? And I, I did. that is often said, that these theories must be compared holistically. I don't believe it, but it's often said. But where does that assumption come into the argument? That I have broken something that is true, and that I've committed a fallacy in the argument? Professor Shapiro. Thank, thank you, David. That was uh, quite lively and, uh, and, and interesting. Um, there are a couple of things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, you, you've, con you've convinced me, I think, that um, there can't be a single foundation, uh, which I think is you're calling the realist uh, assumption, that there can't be a single ontological foundation for all of mathematics, and for the reason I think that you cited at the end, because there's no neutral place from which to assess it. Once you've got it, then you have the isomorphism and Right. And I, I'm not claiming right. this follows validly from what I, the argument right, that I right, gave, but, but I'm claiming right. it's certainly highly suggested yeah. by the argument. How are we going to address the problem if we don't like the contradiction? Well, then it would have to be to give up the idea that there's a single uh, foundation, right? right? Now, of course, what you, know, what you want to say after that is, you know, is gonna, people, are gonna di people are gonna disagree about that. The, uh, the thing I wanted to ask you about, though, is the thing you noted at the beginning. It's, it's, a, it's a theme you've been emphasizing for a number of years now. Like 30. That, well, the particular one, that the meaning is the same. Yes. Right, with that little, uh, little uh, show you did in the beginning. Little, right, a little right. dialogue waiting for now, the, there is a, uh, a, a, a Now, you might not think much of it, but there's a, there's a big industry now in philosophy of language of trying to figure out generally when words have the same content and when they don't. Um, uh, with, other con with other apparently context-sensitive terms, uh, words like to the left, to the right, enemy, uh, predicates of personal taste. Um, and then there are sort of little tests. Now, of course, there isn't much agreement there, but there are tests that everybody you know, is trying to develop for when you have the same content and when, when, when differ. Have you thought that any of that might, might help to um, adjudicate the question that you know, you're, 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 we're interested in? That is, is the meaning the same? That is an interesting thought, and I'd like to pursue it, and I don't know the answer to that question. I thank you for the idea. After the talk, I'll get started. Thanks, Stuart. Look, I'm a little bit slow person, so it was very, I could not really follow all the, the, the proof, so, uh, and the details to, to check whether it's uh, correct or not correct. So all the say it's uh, superficial uh, understanding. So if I understand correctly, you, you say that you derive contradiction from some assumptions, and uh, you blame, and, they are, and, uh, and the conclusion is that something grows on realism or, 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 no, or no single foundation of something. Well, notice that these were not conclusions of the central argument. The conclusion of the central argument is this. If you accept a very watered-down form of realism, that is, that mathematical theorems have their power over us in virtue of their being true reports upon the behavior of mathematical things and the components of those things, if you accept that assumption, then, right, with some simple mathematics, simply pointing out, right, that there is a second-order classical arithmetic, that there's a second-order intuitionistic arithmetic. They're both consistent, right? From those assumptions and Dedekind's argument that all models of second-order arithmetic are isomorphic, a contradiction follows. That's okay, the so argument. Now, from that, these other claims do not follow strictly, but I think they are suggested. Okay, so let me now continue. So, whatever the proof, the detail of the proofs, Sorry for being so old-fashioned, but in order to really understand, to find out what is, if there is a proof of contradiction, what is the, who is to be blamed for the, the, the contradiction, because usually there are any proof of these several assumptions used. Yes. That, and, and I, to be really believe, should know what exactly are the assumptions, what is the language, how to formalize it, sorry, because other days, I have the feeling of you know, switching from one place to talking to synistical, in another place to talking classical. Right. And, and, of, and after I see, and form, see how to formalize, not really fully formalize, but see how to formalize and see exactly what the assumptions, I would tell what, what is responsible. But 
something about my, my impression. First of all, it's not true that you have not used any foundational issue. I've looked very carefully. You use the term functions, you use the term relation, that's what I ask you in the middle, at the middle. You use the term equivalence, equivalent class, and you say, and so all of them come from one foundational, no categories, no structure. No. But in order to understand what you have said, you have to understand this basic notion of the foundation, usual foundational things without it. And, and at, at least when you prove the, that, that, that uh, every computer, every uh, Turing, Turing computer function is computable, to me it seems that you, you, you use circular because if there exists some function that give it this and this, and this is all what you have to prove exactly. So uh, my impression again, I think was on other belt because, it, because it's, a, it's a short time I and mean, one cannot follow this in short time. My impression was that you, for some time you're using terms, uh, what assumptions that are that uh, may more or less equivalent to what is to, to be proved. In other place, you pretend to talk about what not, but really you know exactly what, the, what are the what nots. Right. Notice that. I have not asserted that I would not be using foundational notions at all. You're absolutely right. I'm employing standard foundational notions like set, function, complement, equivalence relation, equivalence class. There's no question I could not get started without those and their basic properties. What I do maintain is that none of those basic properties that I listed, you listed and used, are controversial between the intuitionist and the classical mathematician. They are a common coin to both. So I have not used any foundational notion that could be rejected by either party to the, to the, to the particular dis dispute. But if that, I give the same answer that I gave before. Right? If there is a difference in the notion of function, show me where that difference is. It's not. Well, hold on. A, hold. I love this guy. I love this guy. We've been arguing like this for how many years? Twenty-five. 26? I hate to say it. Okay, let us say it. Let's make real one thing. No chance that I am going to, to, uh, to, uh, to convince you. And I have the feeling that there is no chance that you are going to convince me. But let's have fun doing it though, right? <laughs> I, I think we may be out of time, I guess. I would. Well then, just, just very quickly. What, so, the, what's the role of Church's thesis in the, in the, uh, in the deduction of the contradiction? Well, it is not so, it has a large role to play in intuitionistic mathematics as a whole, as Kreisel okay. liked to point out. Here, it's simply an example of a statement on which the classical mathematician, classical arithmetician, and the intuitionist will disagree. One believes that it is absolutely false in the arithmetic classically. The other believes that it is absolutely true and provable in the intuitionistic or arithmetic. I could have chosen any number of different statements. I chose Church's thesis here for the obvious reasons. I should also very quickly point out, Church's thesis has a, uses in intuitionistic mathematics. One of the most prominent is showing that there's at most one model up to isomorphism of first order arithmetic. That's one of the uses here. So its use as a reduction principle is powerful. But it doesn't have any crucial uh, role in the general pattern of your your, your argument, right? It does not. I could have chosen any statement of arithmetic on which the two principles differ. Is there any commonality among the principles that you would, you would uh, choose there? I mean, in this particular instance, it so turns out that um, those tempted to hold it's false. Um, like everybody in the room but me. Well, I don't know, but, 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 but there's certain relationships between those, that position and the classical versus intuitionist. There are. They need to be better investigated, but there are definitely relations between yeah. them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Wilfred. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>